audio set up. A lovely uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Robin Rimke. I'm the co-director of the Cybersecurity Executive MBA program here at Lancaster University. And I'm delighted to be joined with two experts in core technologies of cybersecurity, very conveniently both named Dan. So we'll have a, an interesting time trying to navigate that over the next few minutes. But uh, a very warm welcome to you all. Before we jump into our conversation, can I just ask you to please keep your camera and your microphone off? This just helps make sure everybody can hear uh, and enjoy the conversation. But we do want to hear from you. So if you have a question or you'd like to comment about something that our Dan's um, have contributed to the conversation, please put that in the chat and I will uh, bring your question in and, uh, and invite you to maybe uh, unmute your microphone, turn your camera on so that you can ask your question yourself. So again, welcome to you all. I'm very pleased to be joined today with Professor Dan Prince, who is a professor of cybersecurity here in the School of Computing and Communication at Lancaster University. And one of our very own cybersecurity in residence, and visiting lecturers, Dan Jeffrey, who will be speaking. He has a long uh, history of working in a variety of organizations, including both public and private, um, large multinational or large bureaucratic kind of organizations, as well as startups. So he's uh, will be drawing on a wide uh, a bit of experience uh, today as well. Um, but today, I just want to welcome you all and begin by asking our contributors. Uh, you just can, you just finished teaching a module together on the cybersecurity MBA <laughs> program called Core Technologies in Cybersecurity. So I'm going to throw it open to both of you to begin and begin by asking you what are core technologies? Why do we care about these core technologies? And especially if I'm not somebody who's a technologist, why should I care about core technologies? in cybersecurity. So I'll, uh, Dan, I'll, I'll let you go first, yeah. We're, uh, yeah, the, 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 this Dan, uh, I, will, uh, I will answer first. So I, I think um, you know, when we were designing the MBA program, Robin, the, 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 the idea of having the core technologies element there was to enable us to work with those on the course who don't have a technology background and give them the, the sound understanding of the key technologies that the technologists will be using uh, and so that they can bridge the gap when having those conversations with them. So many times when you look at, um, you know, some of the issues that occur in cybersecurity, it is around having that bit of that language gap or that knowledge gap. So having sort of a, a sound understanding not just of the, the kind of a knowledge base, but how to critically apply some of these key concepts uh, within your organization enables you to bridge that gap with the, the, the technologists. But I think one of the, the key things, and I'll throw over to Dan uh, in a minute, but I think one of the key things, the way we approach this is not, okay, this is a firewall, this is networking, this is this, this is that, but try and provide the context of how you select technologies why you select top technologies and and so on and and use a kind of a, a very applied you know problem based um uh, approach to teaching the, the the technology so you know here's a challenge go away find out about them here use some of the core knowledge that we've covered but you know using this exploratory approach to to learning so it's not just us giving you lots of information you're discovering things uh, that you need to because that's also an important skill to have, like where do you go for good sources of information around some of these quite complex technologies rather than you know, what chat GPT might tell you or, or what some, you know, some, somebody down the pub might tell you or, you know, something off the internet. How do you actually go and, and find good, useful sources of information that help you to make informed decisions? Dan, I mean, do you yeah. want to... Cheers, Dan. Yeah, and look, to, just to kind of uh, to build on uh, your points, especially around you know, bridging that gap between the real technical folks within an organization and you know, the depth um, of technical detail that they are comfortable with, that they speak to, that they understand, um, and be able to bridge that gap, which helps generate requirement through to be able to speak and communicate that into kind of business language for your execs and for your senior kind of leadership, because ultimately they're the ones who will approve a business case, sign off on budget, sign off on the financing side. 
So you act as that kind of interlocutor between the two kind of worlds, if you will. And that's why it's really important too. In order to achieve that, you need to have the right level of understanding, uh, be able to understand where, you know, what the art of the possible is, certainly, but also understand where, you know, um, folks may be, in inverted commas, pulling wool over your eyes. That's mm -hmm. both in terms of a salesperson from, say, the market, the kind of the, uh, the, the kind of the technology world perspective, the, the company's world perspective, but also um, within kind of the technology uh, teams within your own organization, they may have their own agendas. Be able to kind of keep folks true and have that right level of understanding around core technologies is really kind of vital and imperative uh, for you to be able to, uh, one, achieve the right level of security for the organization, whilst also ensuring that you're able to uh, basically align security to the overarching business objectives of your organization. And to Dan's second point around kind of engaging with the marketplace is really important um, to be able to have a good level of understanding about what the core concepts, what the core types of technologies are within uh, cyber, because ultimately the marketplace um, is very, it's kind of, it's huge, right? It hasn't consolidated yet. Um, there are, it is hyper, hyper competitive. There are a lot of folks out there that do amazing, brilliant things and provide amazing, brilliant, world-leading technologies. But sadly, there are also those out there that look to sell more kind of the snake oil side of things. And being able to distinguish between the two and have the right toolkit, the right arsenal of questions to be able to weed the wheat from the chaff is really important. That's something that we do help drive through and provide the basis from which to build those skills kind of on this course. Sure. Sorry, I was just going to just add in there. I think for me that one of the, the key points is you know, how do we build and work with people to develop their credibility? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that's one of the core things. You know, the, the MBA program, because it's an MBA program, is focused on leadership and management. And one of the key properties of being a good leader and manager is being credible, not mm -hmm. just in identifying the, the knowledge and, and having that ability to speak with the right people, but also the number of times, and I'm sure Dan has come across this, you've been in meetings with managers and they've just asked for the impossible because they happen mm -hmm. to think that's the way it is because of TV, right? <laughs> so being not just credible in your knowledge, but incredible credible in the way that you ask for things and understanding that actually you can't do it in an afternoon the complex piece of software you want building is going to take you six months okay. and i think just going again you know the, the the other thing is you know the snake oil i think some economists would describe as marginal producers <laughs> um, and so uh so the uh, but it's a really important point as as we've seen a growth in cybersecurity, you know the premium products get more expensive that means you get more marginal producers and there's always a downward pressure in uh you know in in costs in any organization you know one of the ways you you know make yourself more profitable is to reduce your bottom line costs and so you know that the incentive therefore if if not handled correctly is to go for these marginal producers and sometimes that can be really innovative because they are innovating on the margins of core production and that you could get some real interesting stuff but being able to understand that and understand the risks of that and understand the risks of using unproven technology enables you to adopt innovation from these kind of edge producers or you know and handle like the cost reduction appropriately but you know you have to have a sound technological mm -hmm. understanding to do so sure you know and i think we we you have so many questions now uh, thank you for those responses but you just just hitting on that issue in talking to business leaders i think one of the things um, so cybersecurity is one of those things that makes them feel most vulnerable because not only is it a slightly opaque area where they may not have any kind of technical history or understanding or background, but it also feels like something that's always evolving, always changing. There's a new risk, there's a new threat, there's a new issue. Um, and I know we're going to be talking about risk management at the end of this week with our students, but um, it does feel like it's something that's always kind of developing. And so even if you felt like you were credible and knew what you were talking about two weeks ago, all of a sudden there's a there's a new new threat, which makes me then think if I was a leader, because um, you both have mentioned levels of safety, levels of awareness, levels of response. And I, I mean, I could see a, a, a leader just going, right, just give me the max, make us as safe as possible. Uh, and then I can just relax and get on with running my business. Um, what's wrong with that approach? Isn't that just sort of making sure all my I's are dotted and T's crossed and I'm 
okay? I learned, well, Dan's been like face to face with this issue for the last five years or so, so <laughs> I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll hand over to him for that one. Uh, well, um, yeah, so, I mean, the, the only way to be fully secure is just to stop the business, right, ultimately, because every activity you have and that you do and any time that you rely or use technology, there will be a level of risk and a security challenge, right? So it's about uh, striking the proportionate and appropriate risk-based security posture, right? So um, you could throw all the... All the all the money of Solomon onto your security posture, um, but the likelihood is you will really hamper the business, the operation, the mission that you are there to protect, um, because ultimately you will kind of go so hard over into security that usability uh, and availability of the service to the target customer, organisation, sectors, or what have you becomes really diminished or not particularly good user experience because you locked it down, secured it so much. So then you actually end up uh, kind of going counter uh, to, to what you to what you intended. So for example, you know, in uh, when to, prior to my current role, um, I kind of ran the cybersecurity program for the NHS. You know, we provided a suite of um, security services, a national security operations center, et cetera, et cetera, to the two uh, local trusts, local organizations, and we supported them with helping them to make the right um, and proportionate and balanced security risk, sorry, risk-based security decisions in terms of the use of technology, deployment of resources. Because if somebody said to me, I have half a million pounds, I could either do this very specific narrow thing here, which is high impact but really really remote likelihood like really really remote likelihood or i could get another 20 nurses for five years which would mean that i could improve the experience the kind of throughput all those kind of things of patients of my local community even as a CISO, i would most likely opt for doing that business that get the, the bigger business benefit pace with the nurses in that regard because actually the thing that you are protecting is so unlikely there are uh, to occur that actually the best use of financial resources is to help kind of um you know with the actual kind of business side if that makes sense yeah no well, and and you mentioned because obviously you mentioned earlier you're wanting to make sure that your strategy for your security um is aligned with your strategy for your overall business your overall organization um is that something in your and i'll, I'll take it to both of you is, is this something that you find business leaders struggle with or are they able to kind of align those quite easily in your experience so i'll I quickly go first dan and i'll hand over to your good self sir um so in my experience i have seen a number of business leaders do um do struggle with this at the moment and the reason being is that they see cyber and kind of the security aspect of their organization as a pure play cost center something that kind of protects the bottom line you know defends against this reduces our liability for x y or z the, the the leaders that really stand out from the crowd if, in my view are those that are able to kind of really tie it to the business objectives the strategic objectives of the whole organization mm -hmm. so that then cyber security investment into cyber actually um, enables top line growth um, the ability to do more with the same from a technology perspective, generate digital trust, which then kind of enables customers to have more faith and, uh, in products and services, which means they're more likely to come back and pay more money. And although you end up in a virtuous cycle, those kind of approaches, um, whilst not kind of um, are not anywhere near common enough yet mm -hmm. across um, across the landscape. And so what people tend to do is to not invest is as they should in cyber because they just see it as a cost center so they do just enough but yeah. not enough to enable uh the sustainable achieving of their uh, overarching business strategy yeah i mean so i, I mean i'll go back to the, the prior question as well because i think it, again it relates as we discussed to this so um a long time ago when i was much younger and more flexible i trained in taekwondo right and, you know, as a self-defense, you don't train for specific attacks. You train on how to defend yourself, 
Mm. And so your point about, you know, it's very fast paced. There's lots of things, you know, changing, you know, lots of things you have to keep up with. <laughs> In some ways, it's this, it's just the same old thing with a different coat on, right? You know, it's, it's, you know, we're still talking about buffer overflow attacks. We're still talking about information leakage. We're still, you know, that these types, the classes of attack are still the same. And so if you think about the way you train for self-defense, you train for classes of attack and being able to respond. So there's a resiliency in being able to respond very quickly and have almost like the muscle memory to be able to respond to the type and then deal with a very specific situation. And so cybersecurity in some way in that defensive aspect has to be the same. You have to have that muscle memory. You have to have the right technology, the right organizational approaches to be able to respond and then be able to have the flexibility to deal with the specific inst instantiation of an issue that's come from across that comes across your desk. And so um, it's it, 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 when you think about that, technology, although it is very important, one of the reasons why we teach it is because there's often a gap of lack of understanding. Yeah. It is not the answer to cybersecurity, it is part of an answer. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we focus on is really understanding the integration of that technology to that overall organizational response to a particular issue. But as Dan was saying, there's, there's a lot of power in understanding how cybersecurity enables the, the, the business and enables you to be able to do what you want. I mean, one of the things I've said, you know, one of my mantras is, you know, managing risks enable you to take more risks in different areas, right? So, you know, people throw themselves out of airplanes. That's a stupid thing to do, but they manage the risk because they're having, an, you know, they, they've got, they check their parachute, they, they've done the training, they're minimizing the risk. So when you think about, you know, production <laughs> facilities, you know, one, you don't just throw, well, fortunately, we don't just throw a whole load of equipment in and no, don't think about the health and safety of the operators, right? We, that, that health and safety, the way that people operate that equipment safely enables that equipment to be productive for the organization. Mm. Just because it's a computer, we need to understand how that equipment, that data, that's, those systems can be, you know, can be empowered to operate safely and, and appropriately as part of an overall issue uh, or potential set of issues that might might come along mm -hmm. and I think Len just linking back you know to the original point I'm a I'm a you know an executive like give me the you know oh, here's an infinite budget I want the best security right mm -hmm. um and again I think that part of why we teach around the core technologies is so that these types of questions or those types of responses don't crop up because mm -hmm it demonstrates the lack of understanding of the way that digital technology empowers your organization by not understanding the issues that it also presents and how to fix them. So by going through these core technologies means that we'll get better informed decision at, at all levels, whether you're in cybersecurity or whether you, you, know, you remain in the core of business because you understand that that's just not viable from a technological perspective, a financial perspective, but also just from a day-to-day -day business perspective. You don't want, you know, you don't want to have to go through a two meter thick door into a bunker to be able to use your systems. It's just, that's not appropriate for the majority of businesses. Interesting. Okay. So I, um, I'm going to ask a really sort of obvious question here, but, but I feel like we need to kind of set, establish this. Um, because in what you're saying to me, what you when you talk about technologies, you sound these they sound like almost frameworks or perspectives or strategies. So when you say core technologies, what is a technology? Well, I, we've got some handy slides perhaps that might help. Well, help. there you go. <laughs> if I uh, if I share my screen and then uh, yep, perhaps, please do. Uh, uh, and again, uh, just while while Dan is doing that, uh, to our our audience members, please, if you have any questions you want to challenge and try to stump either one of our our contributing Dan's, feel free to put those in the chat, and I will bring them up uh, when when we have a minute. Hopefully, you can see that. Okay. Hopefully. So, uh, should I just uh, move on? So, Dan, do you want to just say a little bit about what these these slides are? About. Yeah, so the, the, these slides um, will hopefully give us just a very high level kind of overview around. So if you are set the challenge of how do I proportionally appropriately secure my organization, um, <clears throat> these provide a conceptual operating model kind of framework uh, from which um, we can start to think about how we do that. 
Um, I've used these for years now, this kind of model, and it kind of breaks into three areas and then so we, we'll go into the high level conceptual operating model, but then move into and how does that, how is that supported by a kind of operating capability based on technology? So mm -hmm. it's very high level, it's a starter for 10, but it provides that initial framework. So do you want me just to, to yeah. go through here, Dan? Perfect, thanks. Uh, so here, the conceptual operating model, right? So the way I kind of view this, the way I kind of built this out is, you know, we have to, when we do security, in order for us to be effective and efficient and actually enabling, we need to make sure that we are always aligned. The, the security strategy, um, the investment profile, the resourcing, everything is aligned to the to the overarching organizational strategy that it kind of helps the organization live within its risk appetite and ultimately there is governance and a form of proportion and appropriate control that helps to make these decisions then we have kind of classic operate model left and right hand side on the left hand side this is around actually how do we uh, manage and structure security from a policy a process a delivery um, and a change perspective. Now, on the right-hand side, we go, well, what kind of services and technologies um, and capabilities should we do we need to provide to our organization in order for us to be able to achieve those three things that run across the top of the slide there? And ultimately, you know, to Dan's point earlier, you know, it's not all about technology. It really isn't. You know, the key part is around the people and the teams and then ultimately the, the culture of the whole organization when it comes to kind of their approach to their awareness of cyber security and kind of uh, threats and all those kind of things. So that, again, runs across the bottom here. So just to kind of recap, we have on the next side, we have the reason we do this is we, <clears throat> by having this approach across the top, the security posture and capability is always able to evolve as the business changes. No business stands still for very long, right? If you're in the kind of the uh, pub, if you're in the private sector, you mergers, acquisitions, change, new products, new services, and all those kind of good things emerge, which means which will have an impact on your security posture, the operating environment in which you kind of uh, reside in. So you need to be able to change and evolve your security posture, your security capability, and all that, and your security profile to meet those new and evolving demands. So as we change with the business on the left-hand side, with all the policies and the pro processes and the delivery programs, we need to drive that change through the business. So we may need to uh, alter, tweak, evolve, retire, build new policies, standards, processes, architectural patterns, we may need to stand up and deliver new capability, new training packages, new services uh, into our security technologies. And then ultimately, as we've driving that change through the business, we then need to operate it. We need to ensure that the business is able to continue its operation uh, in a secure manner in light of the evolving, the kind of the, the evolution in its uh, kind of strategy and its objectives. So yeah, I think one of the, this is the kind of the framework that we use when we taught the module. It's like thinking, of, we gave some sort of core conceptual, um, sort of core technologies and used them to, to explain some of the basic principles of security technologies. And then we were, were using this type of framework to kind of help to position those. I mean, I think for me, generally, core security technologies, and Dan might want to jump in here, break down into kind of three areas, right? So there's protect, protective technologies. So things like cryptography, uh, firewalls, you know, the, the, the stuff that prevents bad things from happening. Then you've got detection technologies, which pick up when, you know, because no perfect, no system's perfect, pick up when the, the protective measures fail. And then you've got kind of technologies to help you understand that the data that comes from all these systems and get insights to where, you know, you might want to improve over here or, you know, where people might be sort of trying to target a specific aspect of the, the, the estate that you're looking for. So for me, really broadly, you've got those three types of 
technologies that that are that's in there, protective, detective, and um, you know, uh, an, an understanding, and you know, sort of for me, the, the three top level categories. Uh, and I would just add in one kind of thin layer across those as well, Dan, which is kind of, and this cuts across into more the traditional IT operation side as well, which is recovery technologies. So mm -hmm. things along the lines of backups. Um, you know, uh, immutable backups and all those kind of things, which can fit into a number of other categories, but increasingly, um, as they are used for multiple kind of uh, use cases, they seem they're kind of emerging to their own category, almost in their own right, but not quite there uh, just yet. Um, so should we move on to the kind of the next slide? So just to yeah, kind of bring sorry, yeah. can I just interrupt you, Dan? Do, do you have a, a just brief example of that? How that works? That transition you just described because i think that's very interesting but slightly abstract i'm wondering if it's just in your but own experience this dan yeah yeah sorry you, sorry just yeah but what you what essentially what you were just explaining because i think that's a really um i think you've captured something that a lot of organizational leaders find themselves kind of in the midst of um and maybe not even knowing that it's happening until they're in the midst of it i'm just wondering if you have with, without revealing too many details maybe an example yeah. Of, of of what that might look like. Yeah, so I mean, it's um, yes, yeah, it's, it's fairly kind of a well trodden path that organisations have uh, kind of backups, right? So if things go wrong, etc., uh, they have a copy of the data that was on a server or otherwise, uh, which then once they've restored the infrastructure, uh, they can then put a copy of that backup back into said. Um, in, uh, said infrastructure and they kind of get to a business as usual position um increasingly with cyber security because of the absolute rampant and perpetual rise of ransomware mm. the notion of backup has kind of moved not just kind of outside of the pure purview of it operations and it's becoming a real key kind of tool mm within the arsenal of a security operations center within a security posture because ultimately ransomware um for those who don't know kind of uh, basically encrypts all your data um sometimes they take a copy of it off uh off your estate and say right you're going to pay me x amount of money in y amount of time or i'm going to leak all of this data or i'm going to destroy it or otherwise right so you are literally held to ransom uh once you've kind of kind of though most organizations most a number of organizations don't pay the ransom which is probably from an N, uh, ncse national cyber security center perspective the right thing to do because we don't want to encourage folks to do this they also are left with a uh, in a bit of a pickle because all their data is encrypted um and they need still need to run their business and they're now on in paper based if you have an immutable backup one that is trusted and has a gold image on it um you can then are able to then take that data and restore your business and recover your business in a much quicker more efficient manner than you otherwise would have been able to so i think this is that's kind of what i mean by it's bridging from the sole preserve of it operations into much more of a core component of security operations and they kind of sing hand in glove if i'm honest sure so yeah. i would um I, i'd probably add that as a almost like a general principle and just reflecting on, on what, what Dan was saying. For it, it, perhaps that trigger point is when the technology is an essential response to a malicious act, right? So yeah. you know, as we've seen you know, prior, prior to ransomware, the, 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 there were the, the number of attacks that were specifically around kind of malicious, like corruption of data, it, it just wasn't really on, on the rise because most people um, were were looking at ways to, to, to make money and just corrupting data wasn't really a way of making money, right? But now criminals can make money by holding your data to ransom. Therefore, it's a critical security issue. Therefore, it needs a critical response. And the way to respond, one of the mechanisms to respond to that, if the protective systems don't fail, is to have the ability to restore the data to a known good point. And so I think as a general principle, as as we see, you know, one of the ways to think about what is a core cybersecurity technology is again looking at the classes of attack and the rise of classes of attack and saying, okay, well now because we are faced with this particular threat, that is a, you know, this this is 
a critical important technology that once may have been not important so things like spam filters for example they were really around just to prevent the annoyance of traffic coming in but as they became monetized as a um, you know, as a malicious cybercrime technology, they became really important to make sure that those messages became blocked and therefore it became a critical response to a cybersecurity threat. Fair enough. That makes sense. That makes sense. So I'm just, and thank you for both of those examples because that, that really helps give me a sense of the kind of real life situations and scenarios that leaders find themselves in. Um, so now I'm looking at a rather... Um, comprehensive, shall we say, um, overview around operating capability. Uh, do either of the Downs want to walk us through what this is? Uh, I'm happy to, Dan. Yeah, yeah. That's fine, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, so what we have here is a high level kind of uh, overview of what a, uh, a security technology stack or ecosystem can look like within an organization. Right. So if we looked on, on the previous slide, we looked at some of those services which are kind of offered out to protect an organization, to help them drive the change, to ensure that we enable the achieving of strategic objectives and goals. Here's kind of the next layer down on that technology side. Right. So on the and I just kind of walk through left to right from the from the left, we have the strategy controls, frameworks and operations. Right. So we have the strategy itself. Is the, is, the, is the main overarching set of guide rails, which helps inform what we're going to do in the middle here. A controls framework is to say, right, so, so what things do we want to comply with? What, what do we need to do in order to proportionally and appropriately uh, reduce our risk surface area, our kind of vulnerability uh, and all those kind of good things? And then ultimately, how are we going to operate that? So they all come from the from the left hand side. We then have a series of capabilities in the middle, right? So if we start kind of at the top with vulnerability management, this answers the question of where are we? Where are we exposed at the moment? You know, and this could be in terms of your internet presence. It could be within the estate itself, within your cloud estate, your on premise estate, and it's not a single point in time activity this is something that needs to be done on a semi-regular or regular basis to understand you know, what emerging vulnerabilities um, are on your estate and then you can prioritize those and address those accordingly alongside kind of managing those vulnerabilities you want to make sure that you are always kind of monitoring your core assets uh, your estate, your, your your crown jewels, which I am on this course, you'll hear uh, a number of times. These are the systems, the services, the applications, which if they didn't exist, your business would not operate um, in the way in which you kind of currently know it. So prior to um, my current role, I worked in um, for NHS Blood and Transplant, where I was the CSO there. You know, we knew our kind of crown jewels was... Uh, the blood service, the, the blood technologies, and also the transplantation technologies. They were our crown jewels because ultimately, if they failed, we didn't have a, a business, as it were, and NHSBT would effectively cease to exist. So we want to kind of make sure that we're continuously monitoring those. When something goes, ar goes uh, awry, because it will do, this is a case of when it happens, not if it happens. We want to be able to identify... Um, the nature, the extent, the extremities of that incident in a really crisp, clear, precise manner, and then be able to understand why it happened and how it can be prevented from happening again. And then also ensure that the response is formally and appropriately and proportionally communicated out, not just to the technology uh, users and the technology owners, but also to the wider mm -hmm. ecosystem as you may see fit. Informing your response and your protective monitoring is intelligence. To Dan's point earlier around kind of identifying what's out there to understand what threats you could face, having a robust threat intelligence capability and understanding of the types of organizations or entities um, that may be um, kind of looking to seek some form of advantage against your organization, as well as the types of vulnerabilities which they seek to leverage is really, really important. 
because it helps inform those kind of aspects, those vulnerabilities, those uh, components which you should prioritise in terms of remediating and mitigating against. On the uh, on the more kind of uh, advanced side, the clue is in the name. Uh, we have kind of advanced security analytics. Not all organisations will need this, right? But this is kind of uh, where everything comes together and you start driving automation, uh, orchestration, uh, use of machine learning, etc. And then in uh, some kind of even more limited circumstances uh, for certain for certain uh, organizations, you have active defense. So this is containment, confusion, disruption, where you actively kind of engage with the adversary to kind of put them off the scent, to get them to work within a honeypot so you can understand them better, which then helps inform your threat intelligence, which then helps uh, move into your protected monitoring. So these are just a, this is just an example of a security ecosystem. A number of organisations would kind of say that this is, yeah, effectively a security operations centre, mm -hmm. which is true. Doesn't always have to operate like that. And then ultimately, whatever kind of operational technology capability you have, you're always going to want to under understand and ensure that has appropriate governance, reports on risk, and is done in a compliant manner and helps. Uh, ensure your compliance as an organization sure. Sure. so i mean so one of the things that i would uh probably add and uh, extend this diagram out because th this is this is kind of getting getting you to think about the sort of the responsive aspects of, of an organization how do you get the data how do you know where the issues are i mean one of the things that i would i would add as well in here is sort of those those core protective co technologies so uh mm -hmm. And it's like, OK, making sure that we do have firewalls, making sure that we are using the right level of encryption, mm -hmm. making sure that we are using the right level of access control and authentication technologies, you know, being able to make appropriate decisions about whether, you know, we need two factor authentication to access a service mm -hmm. or whether, you know, just a simple username and password is fine. And what type of two factor authentication do we need a password and biometrics or a password and smart card or, you know and just to understand sort of that core technology set level if you like that that, that is the, the 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 protective element that goes in okay well this is how we fix a security this is the the security controls what we you know re refer to it as how do we put that in place to make sure that we we are mitigating that 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 potential security issue and that we are protecting the flow of data or we're, we're making sure that it's you know encrypted in case you know the portable device that it's on gets goes missing um and i think that that's really important as well as when you're thinking about core technologies it's not just this very powerful um operational process that, that uh, and the, the technologies that drive that as dan dan's described but also having this really quite uh you know core approach within the systems that you buy that make sure that security is embedded in there those controls those responses to security issues are embedded in there and in understanding you know what we try to do on the course and, and a lot of the teaching that i have is to understand you know where these these technologies come from the principles so that you can engage but also engage with other technologists but also you know as a as a you know as an active researcher in um, computer science and cyber security, you know I'm bringing in uh, you know the, the work that we're doing on our projects and and, and research projects and my PhD students are talking about as well. So, you know you, you, Dan was talking about um, uh, you know at, at honeypot and informed defense using information. Now one of my PhD students, it, that's his area. Like how do we actually get really reliable data out of yeah, you know, this kind of active defense so that you can infer and make decisions about the types of aggressors that might be targeting the network. I, I have to, I'm really appreciating this, this framework and I can see how it could be so useful in a wide number of organizations. I think what to me, this framework offers a good bit of flexibility such that you could make it work in um, small SMEs, much larger organizations. Uh, Dan, you mentioned the NHS, which is obviously one of the largest organizations here in the UK. Um, and also recognizing that what counts as safety, what counts as a threat, um, and like what you said, Dan, earlier, uh, about what is actually your priority will, will sort of shift and could even shift within the same organization um, over, over time. 
Um, and I'm just, I, I, I found it interesting listening to you both. You use the word safety a lot. Um, you, we obviously talked about technologies and this is, a, you know, called core technologies, but you use the word safety and security quite a bit. And I think that makes me think about a, a framework for organizing that actually a lot of us are quite familiar with when it comes to things like health and safety. Um, Dan, you mentioned jumping out of planes earlier. Well, we tend to have regulations that stipulate if you do jump out of a plane, we prefer you to wear a parachute. And it has all kinds of regulations about the style and size and the quality and things. Um, and we don't tend to really resist that much. We appreciate that actually those regulations are meant to provide us safety and security. Um, I'm just wondering, are we are we too caught up in the technologies element, element uh, excuse me, element of it? Um, and would it help us as leaders who are trying to really integrate this into our strategic uh, operative, um, if we thought about this more from a safety perspective? I don't know. In your experience, is that helpful or does that distract us from what are the, the you know the key issues? Dan, do you want to uh, start start us off on this one? Uh, yeah, no, it's an, it's an interesting area, right? So there are there is obviously uh, analogy, etc., with the with the whole safety concept. But w where I spent the last kind of five years was in uh, in the NHS, and safety has a series of kind of very definite uh, kind of meanings. Um, so there is complication there. We, if we look at kind of industry by industry, sector by sector, how safety is interpreted, used, understood. There's that kind of challenge. Um, but I think um, security is slightly distinct, if I'm honest. And the way from a cyber perspective, especially from safety, I think the by um, having good secure by design and privacy by design and all those kind of good things and the appropriate levels of security controls in place, you are enabled to engender a safe system, um, but ultimately, um, but ultimately, being safe and being secure are two slightly different things. Um, in, in my mind, Dan, do you want to kind of come in here? Yeah, no, I, 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 agree. I, mean, I think I think you know, we we were using in, in some ways colloquialisms there, to kind of safety and security were the same. I think it's about keeping the assets safe. Um, and, and I think that's the kind of the way that we're considering it. The, the the key challenge is that there are some safety critical industries like you know NHS, and they uh, they have some very safety specific requirements, which often are in conflict with security requirements. So how do you balance that? That's a specialist mm -hmm. field. The other reason uh, that it, it's not similar is is oftentimes in security there is a malicious actor, and then you know we talked about this previously. Uh, and that malicious actor has a, you know, a persistent determinant kind of uh, determinism that really wants to achieve something and will come back again and again, rather than it just being a one off accident. Right. Yeah. So that there's something there that we need to to to, to kind of differentiate slightly. So the, the, the risk, the way that we consider and build the systems need to take into account that there's going to be somebody that isn't it's not just going to be one day we accidentally configure it incorrectly. Yeah. It's going to be there is somebody that's going to, you know, and we see this launch campaigns that last for years trying to achieve a specific negative outcome against large scale organizations because they're critically part of, you know, government supply chains or whatever it might be you know and i think that's that scale is often overlooked i think the way that um the media portray the malicious actors and then the defensive technologies is that you know it's you know day one they they want to hack into a business in the afternoon they've hacked into the business and they've got full control over it right mm -hmm. But like when you actually look at the stuff that happens behind the scenes and the actual long-term reports years of development years of deployment you know sophisticated social engineering and technology and uh you know depending on the scale of the attack and the scale that scale you know is is still decades in the making sometimes so you, you know depending on who you are so that shouldn't be underestimated and that's one of the things that really distinguishes it from safety aspects Fair yeah. and just to, just a kind of final bit on that as well robin it's just i was just thinking along this two kind of quite interesting examples the difference between kind of uh, on the nhs side and say nuclear 
regulation, mm -hmm. right? So from a controls perspective, if something was to go very wrong within, say, a nuclear power plant, they fail close, right? Yeah. That's the that's their position. Everything closes in the NHS. If there is um, a, a challenge, it fails open to enable the continued kind of provision of health and care. Sure. Um, so it's the different industries, different notions of safety or things that security leading to safety that also needs to come in. I think this is the broader context of hopefully tease up for some of those questions there, which is around the contextual and business environment in which you're operating in. That is the thing that really shapes and defines and guides the overarching kind of security posture, um, the culture, the technology requirements and all those kind of good things. Sure, sure. We have a few, I, yeah. I have a couple follow-up questions, but, I, but we have a few questions in the chat that I want to get to. Um, Anthony says, it's great to see this capability, but with cyber continuously changing, how do you determine where to focus resources and budgets to deliver best value? And I think that's a question probably every leader is having to sit down and ask. So um, I, I have a, a two-pronged answer to that. Okay. Uh, Risk management and intelligence, right? So, you know, it, like anything, if there are a series of aggressors coming after you, you need to have the intelligence and uh, to to be able to make the decision. So, uh, you know, uh, back to Dan's point, uh, threat intelligence is a is a core part of understanding the cybersecurity posture. So, uh, that tells you where you need to be making investments, and then based on the threat intelligence profiles that you're getting. Um, then you can then you can model the risks and understand the risks, and then you can make appropriate investments. As I said, when I teach the risk management course, we'll be teaching the risk management course on Thursday. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the risk management is the answer to how you allocate your scarce resource. I mean, it, it is basically the economics of cybersecurity. It's how you say these are where I'm, I, these are where my issues are. This is the budget. This is how I can allocate it. This is the impact it's going to have. But ultimately, what's driving both of those things is information. And so many times I see within cybersecurity incorrect information or assumptions not being tested or guesswork not being tested. Um, and that drives faulty decisions, which then has an impact that you're not being protected, but also has the second in a, another important impact, not secondary, but another important impact that it doesn't enable the business and oftentimes it disables the business and so you know really the primary answer is how do you deal with that make sure you're getting the right information at the right time to be able to make the right decision and that is a business challenge that is that is ultimately what business managers do right get the right information make a good decision based on that from insight and that so cyber security is a business issue mm -hmm. right? but it just requires some specialist that, that knowledge that sits around that and a specialist information sort of pipeline coming in so that you can make those decisions. Dan, did you, you were shaking your head. Is that, would you agree? I mean, is cybersecurity a business decision ultimately? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. It is absolutely a business uh, decision. Um, I'm not sure that uh, all businesses and organizations across, well, across the globe um, and the UK, et cetera, necessarily understand that. Then back to kind of one of my previous points uh, was kind of around, they see it as like a, um, or it's just like a pure play cost center that enables you to tick a box against a mm -hmm. compliance regime. An actual fact, getting it right, understanding it properly, really does kind of drive home the fact that it is a business challenge. It is a business problem. And one of the things that we've been trying to do, um, especially during my time in the NHS, was to get cyber understood, known and treated by the exec, by the boards in the same way as they would treat financial risk, mm. clinical risk, all these other things, right? Mm. Because ultimately it is here to stay. Um, mm. In fact, yeah. it's only going to increase in importance as we become more digitally enabled, et cetera, et cetera. So understanding and being able to uh, kind of apportion resource, be it financial, human, otherwise, to kind of bring those risks in line with appetite is uh it's is vitally important all based off as the as dan said appropriate proportionate timely information and intelligence i mean ultimately one of the things that dr claudia natinson said at the leadership symposium uh dr natinson is the uh, chair of the trustees for the uk cyber security council she said you know if it wasn't a business issue when it goes wrong it wouldn't affect the business mm. right so, you know, 
if cybersecurity goes wrong, it affects the business. Therefore, it is a it's a it's a core part of the business and needs to be dealt with as such. And and technology is part of the solution, but the rest of the MBA is set up to to give you everything else that you need. And that's sort of the way that we that sort of our whole approach at Lancaster and working with our partners is, you know, it, 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 how do we have a multidisciplinary blended approach to this really complex challenge? And that kind of leads on to. Andrew's question where that people cultures and behaviors fit into this this model I think the 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 operating capability that Dan presented I kind of had that on on the edges and it was that that last slide really zoomed into the kind of the core architecture elements but you know just bear in mind that this 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 webinar is about the technologies so that's what we're talking about and alluding to the fact that we need to understand how it links into into the other stuff you'll have to come back for more webinars to find out the answer to that or or come on the mba program but that's um you know that that's really one of the key key things you know this we've got you know you technology is part of one part of the solution mm -hmm. culture is one part operating procedures and management is another part you know th th there are so many components to this that we just need to bring together to be able to have a responsive and resilient um organization in the face of security threats and just building on dan's point i mean if you gave me 500 quid to spend on technology or 500 quid to uh spend on increasing awareness and capability of the staff with regards to uh cyber it would always be the latter yeah. they are it, you solving for awareness and the culture and all those kind of good things really drives rapid meaningful and sustainable kind of uh, increase in security yeah, absolutely absolutely um i think and and that kind of leads us to the to a comment from anthony who says we need to learn how to fail safe and fail secure mm -hmm. uh which i think also speaks to kind of the framework you put up before this idea that failure is almost imminent and maybe actually not Failure is not the right word, but there will be challenges, there will be breaches, there will be incidents that um, we have to address. There's no fail safe approach mm -hmm. when it comes to security. Am I am I right in saying that? Well, I mean, so I, I, I'll jump in because I've done bits of work across multiple different types of sectors. So I, I would probably counter by saying, well, it depends, right? Classic, classic consultancy. Classic but, academic. Um, but. <laughs> The, the, the reason why it depends is because what is what are the criticalities for your industry, right? What is criticality for your business? So if you're a data only business, like and you don't you don't have any safety critical components, then safe failing or failing safe is not important. If you're a safety critical industry where you've got physical environment uh, that needs to be protected, then that again it depends on what is the most important part. So. For example, the like nuclear industry, if there was a cybersecurity breach and everything failed open and people could walk in, that has a whole bunch of other you know, secu physical security issues. Um, and so it is always you know, this careful balancing act between the different priorities of the organization, which is why you don't have necessarily cybersecurity taking primacy over all the other aspects of the business because it's about it's a careful balancing act and, and a prioritization around what is important to the business overall on a longer time frame and then also specifically around certain instances for a shorter time frame so if you have a an incident you may want to you know close down a bit more than you would do normally and that's a typical response because you know you're under attack but on you know normal day to day operation, you might be a bit more open, and and so you know so it, it depends on the tempo of operation, and it's not a static you know decision. You may want to have that sort of overarching kind of level in the background, and then you will fluctuate and change depending on you know the situation that the organisation finds itself in at, at any particular one point. Dan, yeah, did you want to add anything to that? No, just only to say, you know, that's, Dan's explanation there is a really good kind of overview and uh, provides a rationale of why you have security operational teams, right, who are there to kind of pivot and kind of shift with the evolving uh, kind of environment which they're operating in. You have teams that work out, understand kind of the risk management side, the control frameworks and all those kind of good things. But then you have a team that is operationally kind of uh, has an operational posture that deals with incidents, deals yeah. with evolving nature of the environment in which you operate in. Sure, sure. 
with that, I'm noting the time, and I think we are going to have to call call this conversation to a close. Clearly, much more we could talk about, and uh, I will use that as an opportunity to remind our audience that this is an ongoing series of conversations that we have. Um, we've already had quite a few, and those are posted on our YouTube channel if you'd like to go back and look at particular issues around risk, for example. Um, and we have many more coming up throughout the, the rest of the year, so, get, so make sure you take a look at our Eventbrite schedule so that you can get those in your calendar. Calendar. Um, also, too, if you're interested in learning more about how you can learn more about cybersecurity, do uh, let us know. We'll be happy to chat with you about our Cybersecurity Executive MBA and some of our other cybersecurity programs as well. So do get in touch and we'll be happy to connect up with you at your convenience. With that, I want to thank Dan and Dan. Um, for this fantastic conversation. Dan, I'm so I'm so thrilled that you're part of this program as a cyber leader in residence. And obviously, um, Professor Dan, it's great that you are sharing your expertise, both in terms of your research and your, your uh, consulting expertise that you uh, have with us today. So thank you both for joining us. Uh, and to all of you, thank you for joining us on this conversation. Thanks for the great questions. Do keep them coming. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Uh, until then, do take care and be safe. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Cheers, folks.